Brett, here we are, rocking and rolling, episode one of the Milkshakes Markets Madness podcast. And let's just show. jump right in. Show. It's a show. Thank you. It's a show. I, it is. Oh, yeah. It's got it. See, I'm I'm already screwing it up. So let's just jump right in because it's great that I I you know made that little mistake there in the beginning um, because it does highlight the fact that we're taking a different approach to this. And so let's be just different right away. And instead of getting into financial stuff, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things going on around the world right now is the World Cup. Are you a big soccer football fan? I'm a big uh, soccer football fan four times uh, or every four years. I, I, love, I, love big, I love big matches. You know, I would never sit there and watch a soccer match on a Tuesday, random Tuesday afternoon in a, you know, on, a, on a, you know, some small scale. But I, I love it when we get the, the big matches. Like I'm, I'm really looking forward to England, France, just because it's England and France. So that'll, that'll, that'll be pretty cool. Um, and I think Netherlands, Argentina is going to be a great match as well. Uh, you know, Netherlands. Argentina barely even got through, uh, but they're through now. And, um, you know, Netherlands is usually pretty good. So I think that'll be an exciting match as well. Yeah, for people who don't know, at this time of the recording, um, at different parts of the year, I'll be in different places. But at the moment, I'm in Australia, and it's definitely a melting pot of cultures here. And there's quite a bit of Argentinians. There's lots of Dutch here. Um, so I think the World Cup is kind of cool in that you have – you know, the geopolitical environment now is, is, is very forth turning, right? It feels like there's tension everywhere. So it's kind of cool. I mean, even the U.S. playing Iran, it, um, there's a little of that, you know, cultural tension that seeps into all of this, which makes it very unique. I think a little more unique than the Olympics to a certain extent because it's just one focused sport. It's, it's one thing. Everyone's engaged in it. But, yeah, some of these some of these matchups, even Morocco and Portugal, is, is, is there's a little bit of – intensity there a little, bit, so. a little bit of history there right it's like the the moors already conquered spain and now they conquered them again a few days ago and now they're going to go after portugal so it's pretty interesting you know but with the world cup what i like about it, i love thinking about everybody around the world is watching this sitting there doing the same thing you know we were down my, my family and i were down in Colombia over thanksgiving and we went to a sports bar and watched the u.s match and my son and i are sitting there and there's a bunch of uh you know, Colombians there, but there was a bunch of other South South Americans from other countries, and there was a few Europeans there, and it was just everybody's doing the same thing. Yeah, and, and not to keep harping on on the World Cup as a topic, but it, it's funny because there's the U.S. It's just not a big thing, and when when you're in other parts of the world while it's going on, you see the significance. Like yeah. the Brazilians get all kinds of worked up, and and being in where we are time zone wise in Australia, it's, it's like six in the morning and they're all fired up and their gear and face paint and, you know, getting their coffee. And, and so it, it gives you a little bit of a sense of, of how significant it is. And, and we know when we're watching it, you know, these huge arenas around the world are just full of, of, you know, ecstatic fans. And, and yeah, we have, we have big sporting events, but you, you walk into one of those arenas and it, it you know, it makes the, the Dallas football stadium feel small. And but but with that in mind, it's 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 funny because we're never really competitive in the World Cup, and one of the big arguments always tends to be that you know we have other professional sports priorities. And I thought it was interesting. I, I might have shared the Instagram story with you, where a guy was talking about like if our only sport was um, <laughs> was soccer, how it, you know every game would would be two two to nothing or worse. And he, yeah. he highlights his like ultimate, it's like LeBron James in goal. And he has all these, I'll have to pull it up and, and, and show yeah, that yeah, somewhere yeah. In, the sh in the show notes. But I, I thought that was interesting as well. Um, but but uh, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to say to that before I jump on to the next silly topic. No, just uh, I love the World Cup. Every four years, it's awesome to watch it. It's a big global event and um, good luck to everybody. Are you rooting for anybody now in the corner finals specifically to, to take it? I would just way. love to see England win. I would just love to see England win it because they haven't won it forever, and they, they they want it so badly that I kind of want them to get it. Interesting. Well, we'll see how that pans out. Um, the Twitter files was another interesting thing that was kind of going on this week. Um, it's hard to keep up sometimes with with Twitter in general, especially this particular thing because I think Twitter's always been great in that it like opens up these rabbit holes, but this is like a massive black hole. It's like once you even start trying to chew into, you know, yeah, there was this election meddling and the suppressing of the Hunter Biden laptop story, but then you kind of look at some of the, the characters involved and it's almost like, it's almost in itself. I think one of the reasons we're so glued to some of the stuff that goes on in Twitter is it's, it's like our own like 
drama, like real life TV drama going on. And, and so it, it, it is kind of well, and it's very tribal. And, you know, I, I see this all the time on Twitter in, in, in everything, you know, not just, uh, you know, not just finance, not just sports, not just, uh, you know, the, this political drama. But people will see the headline and as soon as they see the headline, for the most part, their mind's already made up. Right. Yeah. They're so tribal. And, um, you know, the, the, the people that were supportive of Musk think this is the greatest thing ever. The people that were not supportive of Musk think it's ridiculous. People are overreacting. You know, the people on the right say, see, this is proof. And the people <laughs> on the left say this happens all the time. It wasn't really like that. And it's so I, I, it's funny when you talk to people. And when I was reading the Twitter files there night and then I was watching the reactions to it, what stood out to me was the immediate responses. Like it, pe- people hadn't even taken the time to read the whole thread. Yeah. But they were already commenting and they were already experts on the thread and what, what, what had happened and what was going to happen. And, um, I, you know, it's probably just a symbol of our culture, but everybody just jumps to conclusions right away. You know, they don't stop and actually think. Yeah, and I think, um, it, you know, Twitter sometimes I feel like should be renamed to Trigger because that, that's perfect, actually. That's perfect. <laughs> because that's all, all it really does is just trigger people's bias. And, um, it's a little scary too because we all have it. It's not like we're we're standing on a throne here pretending like we don't behave in a similar fashion a lot of the times. But it's interesting in the sense of like how lost like the algorithms are so toxic. Like you're just continually getting reinforced. And I think, at least for me, I think something like the Twitter files is a big enough of a bombshell that anybody who's at least somewhat open minded starts to you know question a lot of things that are going on if they haven't already given some of the things that have transpired the last two years. But I think um, it'd be interesting well, to hear what you think. Stuff keeps popping up. Stuff keeps yeah. popping up. Like just today, was it today or yesterday where the, the guy that was overseeing the release of the emails for the Twitter right. was a former FBI guy. Yeah. It's just amazing. Like this, this stuff just keeps happening. It's just, you, you couldn't make this stuff up. I mean, that's, yeah. that's interesting. Like Twitter's like the greatest movie ever because you could never in a million years write this stuff. Well, I feel like 2000. 20 to, to, to present day, you almost couldn't make it up. Really, even just 2022, again, avoiding getting too deep into the financial markets, which we'll do here in a minute, but it's just been such a wild ride. Everything that never could have happened, which is one of my favorite things about Twitter is, is the nevers, you know, the constant, this, this is never going to happen. You know, the Fed's never going to be able to do X, Y, Z. And it just all, it's almost becoming more of like the lead indicator. It's like once people start saying something's never going to happen, you can almost guarantee it's going to. Um, and, and then we've had the, you know, the FTX thing and the rabbit holes that are coming, you know, all the, the collusion and connections. And it's just really, it's a fun place to be. It's a fun place to have like tolerance for politics because there's so many ridiculous things. The way politicians just stick their, their foot in their mouth constantly so it's it's definitely you know if you're watching this for other reasons you're coming across it accidentally and in some way or another we definitely encourage you to get on on twitter and be part of the conversation because it's definitely i feel like aliens either now or in the future are going to come down and get a hold of of twitter and, and to the and where they'll be intellectually it'll be like the equivalent to us like watching apes throw feces at each other well, I think that's kind of what people on the the people that don't like Musk, they kind of feel like he is the alien that came in and now he's in control of Twitter, right? So anyway, it's it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. I pray to God that Twitter is still around in here because I love it. Yeah, same. And um, speaking of kind of random news, Indonesia just passed a um, a law pretty much yesterday that, that's banning um, sex outside of marriage. It's actually a criminal offense. And it's the law goes so far as to not just, you know, I I don't know how they would even um, catch you in the act, so to speak. But um, it goes as far as that you can't even be in in the same bed with somebody. And and for people who don't know, Indonesia is generally a Muslim country. So this is a very like radical, almost religious type of move. And Australians absolutely love going to Indonesia and, and spending time in Bali as a holiday. So this is. Um, this is an interesting little little move. I mean, it's kind of way out on the fringe, to be honest. I, I had I hadn't even heard of it, so I, I'm not familiar with the story, but I'll have to look it up. But I mean, that has to be horrible for their tourism industry. Whoever their head of tourism, yeah. it must have, he must have resigned, right? Surely. Well, so this is the thing that comes to mind when I read these things, and and the U.S. isn't immune to this either. Sometimes we pass policies and, and laws and 
it's particularly when we look at our energy policies and stuff like that. But some of these things that get pushed through, it's, you know, I, I have to shake my head. This one in particular, it's just like people, I feel like in the ivory tower, are just so disconnected between yeah. like what's going on and, and the type of power that they can actually wield. Um, are you um, are you a big reader or a big audio book person? Like, which do you prefer? I, to- I, I like to read. I love. I mean, I one of my dreams is just to someday just go away somewhere and just chill out and just read book after book after book. I'm, I'm always so busy with work, and I always I, I haven't read too many things that weren't work related in the last several years. Uh, but someday I would love to just go retire somewhere and just read books. So. Yeah, the 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 Bill Gates. Uh, summer reading festival. That actually sounds right? amazing. Yeah, it does. That, that, yeah, that sounds like a fantastic way to spend a few weeks. I have to admit, I have my ADD is way too real of a thing for me to be able to sit in a room with a book or many, many books for that long. But um, I am a huge fan because of somewhat of a, a lack of attention of audiobooks. And if anybody um, is familiar or unfamiliar with David Goggins. Uh, former Navy SEAL has done all kinds of crazy stuff. His first book, Can't Hurt Me, was is still one of my favorites, and it's one that I couldn't stop listening to because this guy's life is is just absurd what he's gone through. Um, and he just released a new book the other day called Never Finished. Um, the reason I asked whether you like to read or audiobooks is what's really great about this is the book itself is is a great read, but the audiobook is more of kind of like what you and I are doing. Like he has someone basically read the chapters and then he goes into more granular details to how things penned out. But this guy's life is nuts. And what he continues to achieve, it just continually makes me feel like a loser. And, and, you know, is that continual kick in the ass that I'm only doing maybe 20% of, of what my potential actually is. So that's definitely something I think everyone should, should, should uh, take a moment to check out. Yeah, the the book on the book I'm reading right now is called Treasury's War. I was just looking it up as we were talking here, and I'm trying to find the uh, uh, the author's name. And for, for some reason, my phone is freezing up, and it's not coming up. But it's written about ten years ago. But but I would highly recommend everybody read it. anybody who's interested in finance and geopolitics, and especially you know with all that's going on this year with the uh, you know finance economic financial warfare, the you know the the freezing of Russia's reserves, et cetera. It's all about the policies and the procedures and the efforts that the U.S. government took after 9-11 in order to, 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 to go after either terrorists or other countries or, or, or it's, it's, you know, and again, whether you think it's right or wrong, uh, mm-hmm. I'm not here to moralize and say whether it's right or wrong, but anybody who's interested in the topic, um, I think that it's, it's a great book because it kind of lays out step by step and it gives it concrete examples of some of the efforts that were made to, to, to be able to, to fight a financial war or an economic war. What was the name of the book again? It's called Treasury's War, like U.S. Treasury, Treasury's War. Um, if you, if, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. You know, you know I'm, a very, I'm very good at technology, John. So, um, oh, the guy's name is Juan Zarate. Juan Zarate, Treasury's War by Juan Zarate. Interesting. Well, speaking of treasury dollars and and financial wars um you want to talk a little bit about this post you had the other day um you know the there was kind of a conversation going on about what the um bis had released the bank of international uh, settlements had had made some sort of like wink wink hint hint this could be a problem about this 80 trillion notional value of derivatives um and you kind of commented to that and put a post on that and and i'll 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 bring the um, the charts up later in, in, a, in a post edit, but do you want to talk about that a little yeah. bit more? Well, you know, I think, again, one of the things that I found interesting about this report coming out, and listen, mm-hmm. I highlighted it too, so I'm not necessarily innocent in this, but what, what I did <laughs> think was interesting is everybody immediately had an opinion on it, right? Um, and it's a big number. Basically, it's, a, it's the Bank of International Settlements, and for people who aren't familiar with the Bank of International Settlements, they're often referred to as the central bank's central bank. Um, so they're an organization based in Basel, Switzerland, and all the different central banks are members, and they get together every couple of months, and they all have dinner together. But then there's also staff there that does a bunch of research and helps uh, implement policy, and they help governments around the world implement different monetary policies. So they, they, they do a lot of great research, and they put out a report that just came out, and it talks about $80 trillion worth of notional currency derivatives that are kind of off the books that people don't even know about. And, you know, 80% of that $80 trillion 
is in U.S. dollars. Um, and, and these, and it's not the the thing that you know. Some people would say, "Oh my God, this is such a gotcha." There's eighty trillion dollars of debt out there that nobody knew about. And to a certain extent, this validates some of the stuff I've been talking about. But the flip side, there was also people on the other side said, "Hey, everybody, relax." You can't really talk about notional balances like this because they're offsetting transactions. And yeah, there's $80 trillion of liabilities, but there's also $80 trillion of assets, and they offset each other. And there's truth to that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I think what's really important to understand is that when everything is fine, everything is fine. And what I mean by that is these notional derivative balances don't really matter. They haven't mattered for a couple of years now. But at some point, if things go wrong, that's when notional balances start to matter because these notional balances are between different counterparties. And if for some reason one of these counterparties disappears, either because they can't access the funding that they need or they go bankrupt or whatever it is, you know, now there's a huge hole in this and all of a sudden notional exposure becomes net exposure, right? And, you know, this is this is the type of thing, um, again, these... These, these currency swaps and foreign currency swaps, they're not the same as CDOs that was the big problem in 2008, and they're not the same as CLOs you know, that were, where there were a problem around the same thing. Those derivatives, I would argue, are more toxic than the derivatives we're talking about here. But the same thing happened in 2008. And if you go back 20 years before that, or 10 years before that with long-term capital management, when these derivatives start to fail, notional becomes gross. And when somebody goes out of business, you've got a big problem. And with all that's going on in the world, again, if you're doing currency derivatives and currencies are relatively stable and interest rates are relatively stable and volatility is relatively stable, there's no problem. But when you have currencies moving 20 or 30 percent in a year, like we've seen over the last year, and when you see interest rates go up 500 percent in nine months, Mm. you know, that's when problems start. And when you when volatility spikes, I mean, right now, volatility is kind of near the lowest it's been in a couple of years. But. You know, if you get into an environment where you've got these big movements in currencies, big movements in volatility, and big movement in, movements in interest rates, and then for whatever reason, someone like Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank, you know, who those two are often in the news, you know, that their balance sheets maybe not quite so good, or there's a potential problem there. One of those guys goes down. All of a sudden, you have a huge mess. And so, the fact that it was highlighted, I think, is necessary to be highlighted. And you know, the the, the this show. It's not a podcast, but this show is not going to be the weekly dollar update by Brent Johnson. So just to be clear, I'm going to talk about it every now and then. But it, I, I thought this was a perfect example of things that, you know, the type of things that we'll talk about on the show. Um, the other thing that, you know, maybe we just talk about it while we're here is, you know, the dollar's had a hell of a year. And, and everybody that knows me knows that I'm a big uh, proponent of the dollar going higher. That doesn't mean I'm a fan of the dollar. It just means that's where I think it's headed. And, you know, earlier this year, it, it was on track for its best year in, you know, a very long time. It was up 20% at one point. And it's had this pullback over the last six weeks, and it's pulled back 10%. So now it's up 10% for the year rather than being up 20%. And the disappointing thing for me when I see this, not surprising because I actually kind of find it humorous, but I feel like when I see all the bears come back out as it's pulled back 10%, never mind the fact that it's still up 10% for the year. But I feel like when they all come out and say, okay, that was it, it's over. But I feel like nobody has learned anything over the last couple of years. I mean, there's nothing that they're going to do now that they didn't do in 2020 to kill the dollar. And, you know, and I would argue that in many ways, the U.S., it serves the U.S. interest better to not have a weak dollar right now. And so the idea that now all of a sudden, you know, even though it didn't happen in 2020, even though it didn't happen in 2008, even though it didn't happen in 1999, this time the dollar really is going to die. So I, you know, that, 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 I don't know if that falls under milkshakes or madness, but I just find the whole thing to be pretty humorous. Well, I think that's also one of the, the takes that people don't get, which kind of leads us to, to the, the hater side of the show. And we'll, we'll highlight um, a few comments here, which, which are always fun. Um, this one from uh, Orpheus CV, he says, funny thing when the dollar goes down, you will have to either quit Twitter or actually admit you were an ass all along. <laughs> not, not, nothing wrong with having a theory, but being a dick about it is something you are apparently proud of. And then there's another one um, from Mike Alfred. He, he goes, breaking, dollar milkshake guy moves back into his mom's basement just months after receiving Nobel Prize in economics 
from Twitter influencers with no economics background. So the the thing here is, uh, you know, your your strong position um, or your love for the narrative, I think, is a better way of, of doing it. Really, you know, kind of stirs up people and probably because most of us tend to kind of live in a very dogmatic world. So when they see someone having a um, an opinion with conviction, they immediately respond to it in a, as if it's a, a you know a, a dogmatic stance. And that's one of the things that's always been interesting about you know the dollar milkshake theory, at least your presentation to the world through Twitter, is it's always you know kind of with that caveat that you know number one this isn't going to be a straight line up, and number two that um, I could be wrong. I don't have a crystal ball. And number three, you know, when it's all said and done, the dollar will eventually die. But the the I think the laziness, the intellectual laziness that people, um, I guess, you know, one of those biases of, of recency bias, they're always looking for that that, you know, that analog on a chart that looks exactly like something that was, you know, two years ago and and um, and, and, and think that they have you know, the conclusion because that fits their bias or their dogma. And, and I think you stir them up even more by kind of being passive aggressive in that way. Well, a little bit. I mean, to, to be honest, you know, I, I will say this for the record. For anybody that's watching and anybody that thinks I'm a dick on Twitter, I apologize. <laughs> I'm not trying to be a dick on Twitter. Well, I should, I should take that back. What I really try to do, I, I, sometimes, full disclosure, sometimes, but often it, I feel so, often it's deserved. But anyway. The, the, the point that I like to get, I, I want, the whole point of me doing what I do on Twitter, number one, it's fun. Number two, I actually learn a lot. Number three is I actually want to get people to think. You know, whatever people think of me, that's fine. I, I really don't, I want people to like me, but if they don't, that's going to be fine. But what I really want to do is try to get people to actually just think rather than just react, Right. And so sometimes I do that with sarcasm. Sometimes I do it with humor. Sometimes I do it with a blunt hammer. Right? But I, I can promise you it, it's, it's never meant to be mean-spirited. I, you, you, on Twitter, you don't see me laughing. You don't see me smiling. Um, you don't hear the sarcasm necessarily. But, you know, this uh, – I'll give you a good example. A couple of weeks ago when this news came out that Ghana was now going to start buying oil with gold. And so they were going to – everybody look up. Oh. At the end of the dollar, another country is moving towards gold. Okay, okay, fine. Read the article. Consider it. But first of all, this is Ghana. Number two, ask yourself why they are having to use gold to buy oil. Not because they want to. It's because nobody will accept their currency. <laughs> and so, you know, when I will respond to these things, it's, because, it's not because I don't want people to consider it. But it's because I want them to think a little bit further than just the headline and actually what does it mean. And so, listen, if, if, if people think I'm a jerk or a dick or whatever it is, so be it. I can tell you that's not where I'm trying to come from. But, you know, this is Twitter and Twitter is war. And sometimes you got to sometimes you got to do what you got to do to survive war. That's um, that's going to be the quote for the show. This is t uh, Twitter and Twitter is war. Um, and I, I think the quote. For, for this episode and generally this, this show of our own is, like you just said, number one, we want you to think, right? We, we want you to think about these, these ideas and just things that are going on around the world that are even outside of financial markets. Like really look under the hood and, and give it some, uh, some second thoughts. Um, have fun was the other thing that you said, and that's what we, we hope to do here. Um, and ultimately through both of those things, you know, that you get to learn. Um, and so I'm, I'm not overly surprised that our, our first go at this, we're slightly over our time mark at just around uh, 24 minutes, but I think, I think we did a good job at keeping it concise and, and having a little bit of fun, but also being very topical in the, in the milkshake sense. And, um, we hope people will come back, uh, next week for, you know, another episode of milkshakes, markets and madness and, and another roughly 20 minutes of, of learning, laughing, and deep thinking. Brent, thanks, man. I appreciate you uh, joining me, and this is going to be um, a good ride. Great being here. That was fun. We'll do, uh, looking forward to do it again next week. And anybody out there that wants to follow along, please do so. If you want us to talk about something, send us some ideas. If you want to send John hate mail, I'm happy to read it on the air, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yep, and, and uh, again, you can find us milkshakespod.com. 
We're on Twitter at Milkshakes Pod as well. But just remember, this is not a podcast. It's a show. All right. We'll see That's everyone. Not financial uh, advice. It's just fun. Yes. We don't have one of those fancy disclaimers yet, but none of this is financial advice. We're just having a good time and, and sharing some thoughts and conversations. So we'll continue doing that next week, and we hope you're there with us. Thank you so much. See you then.